and the hydrogen in the universe turned into helium. And the amount of helium in the universe exactly matches up what we expect from theory. So this is a great accomplishment for science to say that we know how much helium there is in the universe because of a theory that predicts what happened 13.8 billion years ago. So that is also an incredible accomplishment. We also know the shape of the universe and geometry. Now this is a little bit of a puzzle, a little bit hard to understand, but we know the shape of the universe in three dimensions. So what we have to picture is the universe itself, space itself having a shape. And there's been a mystery for a long time about the shape of space, but finally we know, because of calculations, that space is flat. Flat like a box extending in all directions. That means if you travel in a straight line in any direction, if you keep going in one straight line, you'll eventually keep going forever, and you will never reach your starting point again. That's true in any direction, up, down, left, right, back, forth. The universe is infinite in all directions. You keep going in a straight line in all directions. However, until we dis discover this, we didn't quite know what the shape of the universe was. And when I was growing up in textbooks, they would speculate about the shape of the universe. They would say, is the universe a hypersphere, which is like a sphere, only in a higher dimension? Or is the universe a hyperboloid? Or is it hyperplanar, meaning flat? Well, we can think of these as something like the shape of a cricket ball, only extended into a higher dimension. Is the universe shaped like a cricket ball? Well, we don't think so. Is it shaped like a Pringle, like a potato grip? Well, that was a theory for a while when the universe was curved like a saddle shape or like the shape of a Pringle. Or well, we've taken careful measurements and we see that the universe is not that shape. There were even some theories some years back that the universe was shaped like a donut, which we technically call a toroid, meaning that if you travel in one direction, you loop back on yourself and you reach the starting point again. So there have been uh, calculations to see if the universe is shaped like a toroid, and that's been ruled out. Well, interestingly, the idea of a donut-shaped universe was mentioned on a program that I, I appeared on, 20th anniversary special, which some of you may have heard of, of the system. And in one episode of The Simpsons Show, Homer Simpson meets Stephen Hawking, which I call the greatest meeting of minds of all time, the two most intelligent people in history. And when Stephen Hawking was talking to Homer in Moe's Tavern, Stephen Hawking was, uh, asked Homer about some of his theories of science, and Homer said that the universe is shaped like a donut because, of course, Homer Simpson loves donuts. And Stephen Hawking said, your donut-shaped universe theory is very interesting, Homer. I might have this feeling. Well, when I saw that episode, I thought, well, could there really be a donut-shaped universe theory? That sounds a little bit crazy. But in fact, there are some ideas that the universe is shaped like a donut. So if you could take the universe and glue it so that one side of the universe is glued to the other side, then the universe will be a donut shape. And that would mean that if you take a beam of light, if you take a torch and shine it in one direction, the light from the torch would eventually go back and reach the original point, the starting point. Now, of course, the light would have to travel for billions of years before doing that, but theoretically, light could travel around the whole universe if it were shaped like a donut. Well, is that the case? We don't know that, but we could test that. If the universe were shaped like a donut, it would be kind of like a Pac-Man game. So maybe some of you have ever played the game Pac-Man, where the characters will move off the screen and all of a sudden appear on the other side of the screen, like magic. Well, why does it happen? 
is because this black Pac-Man screen is really a toroid. It's really periodic. So things that go on one side appear on the other side. So possibly could the universe be like that? Could it be like a donut? Or... Or something could not like donuts, so maybe it could be a toaster shaped universe. That's another theory. A pill, like a pill dozer. Well, we can test the theories about the shape of the universe. To test the topology of the universe, you have to look at the ancient light from the universe. So, we're lucky because cosmology has a baby picture of the universe. So sometimes if you visit somebody's house or somebody's flat, they show you baby pictures of people. And they say, this is what my son or daughter looked like, you know, when they were three months old. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we had a picture of the universe when it was very young? Well, the fact is that we do. We have a picture of the universe when it was very young. Now, young for a universe, the universe is very old, at 13 point billion years old. So young for the universe is not three months. Young for the universe is 300,000 years. That's considered young, okay? So, uh, and the picture of the universe from 300,000 years is when atoms first formed in the universe, and away from that, formation of the first neutral atoms was released into space. That light was very hot, and that light was not perfect in temperature. There were some differences in temperature, and that light cooled down over billions of years, and now we can see it today. It's become static. It's radio static. So if you turn on a radio or turn on a television, and you hear some static, a part of that static is leftover noise from the Big Bang. So it's really incredible. We're surrounded by noise from the Big Bang, leftover. That noise was emitted 300,000 years after the Big Bang and has cooled down over the years because if you take something and expand it, the universe is expanding. As the universe expands, things cool down. So this radiation cooled down. So a lot of what we know about the universe is from this cool down radiation, which has been mapped out now by three different satellites. First, the COBE satellite in the 1980s, then the WMAP satellite, and now the Planck satellite, the European satellite, which is just releasing its results. So we're just finding out more and more about the baby picture of the universe and looking at differences, very, very, very small differences in places that are a little bit hotter and a little bit colder. And we're talking about differences of 1 in 10,000 degrees Kelvin. But these differences can tell us a lot about what the early universe was like. And one thing we can learn is about light in the early universe. And that light in the early universe, we see if it's traveled around the whole universe. And if it does travel around the whole universe, it adds up with itself. Now some of you, if you took a physics course, heard about something like standing waves, which is like plucking a guitar string. Well, if light could travel around the universe, if the universe was shaped like a donut or a dosa or a toroid, then light could travel around it, and then it would add up on itself and it would make these standing waves. So scientists have been looking for these standing wave patterns, but they don't see them. They also look for the shapes of these light blotches, and if the shapes are stretched or compressed, then that means that the universe was curved. If the shapes look normal, like normal triangles, normal circles, then the universe is flat. Well, they see the shapes looking normal. So that's why they think that the universe is flat and infinite. So, we know a lot about the universe, but ironically, the more we know about the universe, the more mysteries have emerged. So, the biggest mysteries of our time, perhaps the biggest mysteries in science, are called dark matter and dark energy. As it turns out, 27% of the universe is made of dark matter, and 70 
and 68% of the universe is made of dark energy. So that means that only about 5 or 6% of the universe is made up of the stuff of you or I. So very little percent of the universe is made up of atomic material. Most of the universe is made of invisible material, which is truly mind-blowing. So astronomers, when they look at the universe, they're only seeing at most, even if they have the best telescopes, they can only see about 95% uh, of the universe. 95% is a mystery. But what is dark matter? Dark matter is the invisible glue that holds galaxies together. We know about dark matter because if it weren't for dark matter, galaxies would fall apart from each other. You wouldn't have clusters of galaxies. Galaxies tend to come in groups, like packs. They come in clusters. If we didn't have dark matter, the galaxies wouldn't stick together like that. You need a gravitational glue of the dark matter for galaxies to stick together. Also, if it weren't for dark matter, galaxies themselves would fall apart. The galaxies are a little bit like pinwheels or merry-go-rounds. And if you see a merry-go-round and you see a horse on the outside of the merry-go-round moving around, you think, well, something must be pulling the horse around. You don't see a horse go around on its own. Well, the something that's pulling the outermost stars in our galaxy around must be mostly dark matter because there's not enough stars in our galaxy to pull the outermost stars around. There's not enough gravitational glue from the visible material. There must be mostly invisible material in the galaxies. And that's the dark matter. Now, dark energy has the opposite effect. Dark energy pushes galaxies away from them, each other faster and faster. So galaxies are moving apart, and that expansion is getting faster and faster over time. It's getting greater and greater, so galaxies are becoming more and more isolated over time, which is truly remarkable. So we really don't know what these things are. There's another mystery called dark flow, which is a little bit controversial, and that's something like a drain in the universe in which galaxies are moving in one direction almost as if someone took a scholar out of a drain and the water is flowing in that direction. And it's controversial because we don't know if it's a real effect or a statistical effect. That's still being analyzed. So these are some of the big mysteries of cosmology today. And we don't know what dark matter is. There are some candidates, which we'll talk about, and we absolutely don't know what dark energy is, but I'll be talking about some of the theories behind these in my talk. So we find these things out through these telescopes. So we see a picture here of the Planck satellite, uh, sorry, the Hubble Space Telescope, which is mapping out the outermost universe and revealing to us the mysteries through scoping out light from galaxies that are billions of light years away. So we're looking backward in time, billions of years, through our eyes, through our cosmic eyes, which is the Hubble Space Telescope and other space telescopes. Here's the Planck satellite, which was launched a few years ago, and is only now revealing data about the early universe. And this has mapped out the, uh, the baby picture of the early universe, which we see here, which, which, has, which has half the cold uh, spots. So we see a baby picture of the early universe. The different colors represent hotter and colder spots. Slightly hotter and slightly colder. So let me, before I proceed with the talk further, let me just define some terms. So I want to distinguish between the observable universe and the actual universe. And this is a little bit confusing in cosmology because we talk about the observable universe, which is what we can see, and the actual universe, which is everything out there. And the two of these things could be the same or they could be very different. Because beyond the observable universe is the mysterious. Beyond the observable universe, we cannot say anything definitive 
because it's beyond the range of telescopes. So the observable universe is everything we can see or potentially see with our telescopes. So anything that the Hubble telescope can see theoretically, hypothetically, is the observable universe. So where is the observable universe? Center. So the center of the observable universe is NITT. Why? Because we're here. Wherever the astronomer is, that's the center of the observable universe. And so we all feel very proud. We're at the center of the observable universe now. Not the actual universe, but the observable universe. So if you take out a telescope and point it in any direction, you're at the center because you can see equally far in all directions with your telescope. Now the radius of the observable universe is the distance to the farthest light sources you can see where they are at this time. So those would be galaxies usually. So we say that the size of the observable universe is 46 billion light years. That means that it's the distance that light would take to travel in 46 billion years if you could travel that distance. Now that sounds a little strange, because if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, why is the observable universe 46 billion light years across? And the reason is because every time a galaxy gets off light, it's expanding with the universe away from us, so it's moving away from us. So the galaxies that gave off the light that we could see have moved very, very far away since then. So that means that they are much further away than they were when they gave us the light. It's like tossing a ball. If somebody tosses a ball to you and you catch it, and then they move farther away, they start moving backward, they could be really far away from you if they can run really fast. And you say, well, how could they throw the ball so far? Well, they didn't throw the ball so far. They threw it when they were closer. Now they're really far away. Well, that's the same with the galaxies. They threw the light to us when they were much closer, and now they're really far away. So we can see galaxies that are 46 billion light years away from us. That's the maximum. How about the actual universe? Well, we are not at the center of the actual universe, unfortunately. We are not at the center because there is no center. So you could say, paradoxically, you could say everywhere is the center, or you could say nowhere is the center. So more accurately, you say there's no center of the universe, of the actual universe. There's no special place, because as Copernicus showed many centuries ago, Earth is not special, the solar system is not special, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not special, in fact, there's no place in the universe that is special. If the universe is infinite, then no point in the universe is special. So that is rather humbling to think if the universe is infinite, that we're only a tiny speck in a vast, vast universe, and we're not at the center, but we could be nowhere near the center because there's no center. So then we say, where did the Big Bang happen? Well, the answer is the Big Bang happened everywhere because it wasn't an explosion. The Big Bang was not a single explosion. It was an expansion of space being stretched further and further out. So imagine taking a sheet, a stretchable sheet, and putting polka dots on it. So you put dots all along the sheet. And if you stretch your sheet, all the dots will separate. And every dot will be farther and farther away from every other dot. But if you take that and videotape it and push it back in time, Every dot will get closer and closer until eventually all the dots will be lined up. Well, that's what we think about the galaxies. If you run the universe back in time, the galaxies will move closer and closer together until everything is bunched up. So even infinite space can be bunched up into a single point if you run far enough back in time. So that's what we think the universe was like. So, 
Is the big bang slowing down? Well, the answer is no, actually, it's speeding up, which is a very, very surprising answer. Because when I was in school, even when I was in university, everybody said the Big Bang was going down. And why is that? It's because of gravity. So if you take something and toss it into the air, or for example, you bat a cricket ball into the air, I hear that cricket is very popular here right now, for some reason. I've been told. Well, if you bat a ball into the air, it's not going to keep going faster and faster. Right? If, if it kept going faster and faster, what would happen is the opposing team would faint. They'd be like, how could they get a cricket ball to go faster and faster in the air? And your team would win by default because you can face the other team. But that won't happen unless you use magic or you have some kind of propulsion system in the ball. Because gravity will bring a ball down. Anything you throw up will go down, unless that very best, if you're strong enough, if you're like a Terminator or Superman, you can throw something into orbit. But it still slows down, it doesn't speed up, it just goes into orbit. So you can't really throw something to speed it up. Well, the universe, surprisingly, does not obey gravity completely. It has something extra. It has an anti-gravity force, which is the dark energy. And we know that the dark energy is there because the universe's expansion is speeding up faster and faster. Why? We don't know. It's a big mystery. It's one of the big mysteries of our time. What's causing the universe to speed up faster and faster? And this was discovered by two Nobel Prize winning teams, one led by Saul Perlmutter, and the other led by Brian Schmidt and Al Kreitz. And they made this discovery back in 1998. So I presume that is after most of you were born. So we're talking about all of our lifetimes when we figured out that the universe is moving faster and faster. So this is something that's relatively recently in the history of science. Okay, and it's really amazing. So this 1998 discovery happened because the teams of cosmologists looked at supernova. Supernova are exploding stars. So if you have a, a really, really big star, much bigger than the sun, eventually it explodes. Now the sun is not going to explode, so don't worry about that. Don't wake up tomorrow in a sweat worrying that the sun is going to explode tomorrow. Because the sun cannot explode. Don't worry about that. The sun will eventually get bigger and bigger and eventually engulf the earth, but that will happen for billions of years from now. So don't think that you can you know, stop worrying about your exams because the sun will explode or engulf the earth. You still have to worry. It's billions of years from now. But it won't explode. But other stars that are much bigger than the sun do explode. And Scientists know a lot about these explosions. They can predict how much power these explosions have. So because we can predict how much power the explosions have and with, we can see how far something is away from us. Because we use something called a standard candle. A standard candle means something of no energy output. And because we know the energy output, we know how far away it is from us. It's like if you were in a dark hallway and somebody was shining a torch and you knew how much power that torch usually put out, then you would have some idea how bright it is, how far away it is from you. You would know how close you are to the person or how far away it is based upon how bright it appears. So we look at these supernova, we see how bright they appear, that tells us how far away they are, and that tells us how far away the galaxies are. So we can map out galaxies billions of light years away using this technique. We can also look at the light from the galaxies, which is shifted into the blue or red directions, and that tells us how fast the galaxies are moving. That's called a Doppler shift. So that's like if you hear a siren, and you hear it getting 
lower and lower pitch, you know that the vehicle is moving away from you, and if it's going higher and higher pitch, then you know it's moving toward you. That's called the Doppler effect. So these teams discover, based on these two effects, that the universe is expanding faster and faster. Now I have a little story about one of the people who discovered this, Saul Brookmutter, one of the discoverers, is from Philadelphia. And I met his mother. I used to work uh, at a food cooperative. It was a food cooperative in Philadelphia. It was a grocery store. And if you buy food there, you get a discount if you work at, in the kitchen. So one day I was working in the kitchen, and it was around 1998, and I heard about this discovery, and I thought, wow, this is one of the biggest discoveries in science. And I knew about it, but not that many people knew about it. It later won the Nobel Prize. And I was working in the kitchen, and I was washing dishes, and there was a woman next to me, middle-aged woman, and she was washing dishes too. And we introduced each other, and I said, hello, and she said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a physicist. And she said, oh, that's very nice. My son's a physicist too. And I said, oh, really? And I said, what's your son's name? And she said, Saul Perlmutter. And I said, Saul Perlmutter, he made one of the biggest discoveries in science, discovery that the universe is accelerating. That's remarkable. Your son, you know, your son did remarkable work. And she said, oh, that's nice. I'll tell him that someone likes his work. <laughs> Incredible, you know, you should be really proud of your son. And she, and she said, Oh, I'll tell him you two should become friends. Maybe we can put you in touch with each other. And by the way, do you know any nice girls for him? <laughs> <laughs> so I, found out, I Googled his name and found that he got married a couple years later. So he did find, I didn't have to help him with that. He did find somebody. So I still remember that story. And I always think about it that sometimes it's the mother who's very caring about the child, the mother or the father, who instills an interest in science, and then the child goes on to, to make a big discovery in science. So, um, and he's, I've talked to him, and he's a really, really nice person, and he's also very musical. So he's named, every time he looks at a supernova, he names it after a famous composer, Mozart or Brahms or Beethoven, because he's interested in music. So that's a little bit of a story behind the story. I always like to hear, to learn about the personalities behind science. Not just the scientific discoveries, but also the personalities. So here we have a picture of the expansion of the universe. Now if you look at the colors, you see a red color, a blue color, a green color, and an orange color. Well, the blue color, the green color, and the orange color were the theories of the universe before the discovery. So before the discovery, there was a big crunch theory that the universe would expand and then collapse again and crunch down again to a point. Then there were some theories that the universe would slow down and never quite crunch down. But the red was the actual universe, the actual discovery. So that was very, very surprising. Now you notice the red is getting bigger and bigger. That means the universe is going faster and faster. So the actual universe is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but eventually, at some point, we won't be able to see farther than 62 billion light years away. That's the limit. So that means that there's going to be a horizon of the universe. The horizon is the farthest you can see. It's like if you go into the ocean, if you see a ship, the ship keeps going further and further away from you, but eventually it goes over the horizon so you can no longer see it. So over time, as the universe expands, galaxies are going over the horizon and eventually disappearing. So because of the acceleration of the universe, more and more galaxies are going to disappear over time. Eventually, our local group of galaxies will be a hermit. Just the Milky Way, Andromeda, and a few other galaxies will be alone. We'll feel really lonely and isolated. We won't remember, perhaps, the other galaxies. Perhaps the other galaxies will be like a myth, like stories. Someday, parents will be telling their children that 
we used to see all these galaxies out there years ago, but they no longer are there because we can't see them anymore. Because the universe is expanding so rapidly that the galaxies will go over the horizon and light won't be able to travel to us from these galaxies because they'll be moving too quickly. So, since we don't know what the dark energy is, we don't know if it's constant or not. It could be getting stronger, it could be getting weaker, or it could be staying constant. Well, if it gets stronger, we call it phantom energy. And the paper that described this was called The Phantom Menace. Now, maybe some of you saw that one of the Star Wars movies is called The Phantom Menace. Well, this paper was named after the Star Wars movies. So sometimes physicists or astronomers have a sense of humor and they try to pick something from popular culture and talk about it. And so they took something from a Star Wars movie and they called it Phantom Energy. And they said if dark energy is getting stronger and stronger, it could be a phantom menace and rip the universe apart. And this is called the Big Rip Scenario. The Big Rip Scenario would happen if dark energy is getting stronger and stronger and eventually becomes stronger than everything, including the forces that hold atoms and nuclei together, the strong force and the weak force that all uh, fix together, particularly the strong nuclear force. If it becomes stronger than the strong nuclear force, then atoms themselves will rip apart and everything will rip apart. And here's a sort of a, an image of this uh, by an artist who, who illustrated one of my books. Uh, an artist named Lynette Cook, who drew a imaginative picture of the, the Big Rip. So this is what's going to happen if the Big Rip happens. So suppose you're living in the world 16 billion years from now, and then you read in the newspaper, you pick up the newspaper and says, Big Rip is about to happen. And you say, ha, oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe this Big Rip is going to happen. But then all of a sudden, you notice two months before the Big Rip, you notice the planets are being pulled away from the sun. So you would say, well, this is a little bit strange. The planets are being pulled away from the sun. That's because dark energy has become stronger than the gravity in the solar system. But then you still don't believe it. Then all of a sudden, you're looking at the moon in the sky, and the moon is pulled away from Earth. And you say, bye-bye, moon. But you still don't believe it. And then, all of a sudden, you see the sun explode. And you say, ah, oh, I wonder why the sun exploded. And you still don't believe it. And then, about, about uh, 12 minutes later, the Earth explodes. But by then, you're in a spaceship. And you still don't believe it. But then, all your atoms are ripped apart. And then finally, you realize that big, big rip was happening. And then 30 quintillions of a second later, all of space time is ripped apart so nothing exists. So everything in the universe would be ripped apart like a fabric torn to shreds. That's the idea behind the big rip. Very scary. Now, if dark energy becomes weaker or stays the same, you don't get a big rip, you get a big stretch. So the universe becomes stretched but doesn't tear apart, which is good. But you still have our galaxy would still be a hermit. Andromeda would be our only neighboring galaxy. And eventually, the Milky Way and Andromeda are due to collide with each other. So we would become a mega galaxy. The Milky Way and Andromeda put together. And then eventually, all the stars in, the, in our galaxy would either turn into black holes or die out and become white dwarfs. So our sun is going to become a white dwarf, which means a star that, that burns out slowly, the larger stars are going to become what are called pulsars, which are blinking stars, or black holes, which are extremely compact remnants of stars that are so strong that not even light can escape. Now, black holes, as Stephen Hawking showed, black holes eventually decay. They eventually lose all their energy and dissolve. And that happens over trillions of years. So if you waited long enough, eventually everything in our galaxy would dissolve and nothing would be left. But this would be a very slow process. So one of the strange things about dark energy is that particle physics predicts the kind of dark energy 
because according to quantum theory, even the vacuum of space is full of particles. So even if you go into empty space, that's full of particles that come in and out of reality. It's kind of like if you look at the ocean, and you see dolphins jumping up out of the ocean, and they go back into the ocean. Well, particles do the same thing. They come up in pairs, as you really, and they go back into the vacuum. But when this happens, this creates energy. And this creates an energy that looks like dark energy, but is much stronger. So actually, one of the mysteries of dark energy is not just why it's there, but why it's relatively weak. Because if dark energy was much stronger, we wouldn't exist today. If it was so much stronger than gravity, that stars and galaxies could form, the Earth never could have formed. But it's actually pretty weak. It gives us billions of years to exist. So we're lucky that dark energy is relatively weak. Well, how can we understand why it's so weak? Well, there's some theories about that. One theory is called the holographic universe. The holographic universe says, and this is probably the deepest, most complex thing I'm going to talk about in the talk, so it's a little bit hard to understand, but it says that all the information content of the universe can be seen on the surface. So that everything, all the information we have in the universe is not really three-dimensional, but really two-dimensional, can be seen on the surface. Almost as if you could see a picture on the surface of everything that's happening within. So the reason some people believe in this is because of black holes. If you have a black hole and a spaceship goes to the black hole, you see a picture of the spaceship on the surface. Because time slows down for the spaceship, and eventually time stops for the spaceship, and you see the spaceship frozen on the surface of the black hole. So everything that happens to the black hole is frozen on the surface. So all the information in the black hole is contained on the surface. Well, if this was true for the universe itself, then everything we're doing right now is also echoed on the surface of the universe, on some layer. And that places a limit on how much information there could be in the universe, an upper limit. And because of that upper limit, that means that, that, means that you have also an upper limit to how much energy there could be in a particle. And if you place an upper limit to how much energy there could be in a particle, that means that the particles can't be infinitesimally small. They have to have a finite size, according to quantum theory. Kind of like if you look at a computer screen or television screen, if you look at the small, smallest view of it, you see pixels. So it might be that the information in the universe is really pixelated, and that would mean that there's less energy in the universe than if the universe had an infinite amount of space. If you have pixels, that limits the amount of energy, and that's one explanation for why dark energy has the value that it does. So now I want to go back in time and talk not about the far future of the universe, but the past of the universe. So in the past of the universe, the distant past, the universe was expanding super, super rapidly. Now we're talking about the first trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. There was an era called the era of inflation. This happened right after the Big Bang. And the reason we believe in inflation is because the universe is relatively smooth. If you look in one direction of the universe and look in another direction, there are only small differences in temperature and small differences in the amount of galaxies. If you go in one direction and count the number of galaxies, and you go in another direction and count the number of galaxies, Look in one direction, take the temperature. Look in the other direction, take the temperature. They're almost the same. So something evened out or smoothed out of the universe. So the universe is at as even in temperature as a bowl of porridge. It just comes out. It's just been cooked. And it's completely even in temperature. OK? Well, that means that the whole universe must have been heated up at once. Well, we don't believe that. We believe that that photons or energy particles must have traveled across the universe. Well, the standard theory of the universe means that the universe, when light was traveling, light first traveled, 
would have been too big for light particles to travel across. So in the original theory of the early universe, the universe was too big and moving too slowly for light particles to travel across. So that's where they came up with the idea of inflation. And the idea behind inflation is as if you have a bowl of porridge that was heated up and really tiny, and all of a sudden, you switched from a tiny ball to a humongous ball that was a trillion times bigger. And you stretched it out very quickly. So you stretch it so quickly that it didn't have time to change the temperature. So it still had all the same temperature. And also, when you stretch it out, it would become very flat, which explains the mis another mystery of the universe. Why is the universe flat in shape? I mentioned earlier that the universe is like a box. It's not like a pringle shape, it's not like a donut shape, it's not like a sphere, it's completely flat. Well, the explanation is that the universe expanded so quickly, and that's what flattened out the universe. It's like taking a sheet, a bed sheet, that has a lot of wrinkles. If you pull it really quickly, it's going to flatten out all the wrinkles and make it completely flat. But we think that the universe expanded at a super rapid flight pace very early on, this expansion made the universe super flat and also very, very even in temperature. Now, there are very small differences in temperature. So I think of them as like tiny raisins in the porridge. So, or tiny dates in the porridge. But where did these come from? Who put raisins in the porridge? Well, these come from random quantum fluctuations. So quantum mechanics says as I mentioned before, that things can come out of that the vacuum, things can come out of nothingness. Well, suddenly, because of quantum fluctuations in the early universe, little blips appear, little uneven things. And when the universe expanded really quickly, those little blips, those tiny raisins in the barge, expanded very quickly. And they made huge blips. Those huge blips had greater density than the other places. They were a little thicker. It's like a thicker part of the porridge, and those thicker parts have more gravity, and they attract more and more matter, and that's what made the stars and galaxies. So inflation also explains why there are stars, why there are galaxies, and why we are, we are here today, because of the theory of inflation. That tiny blips expanded and became the seeds of stars and galaxies. Now, we, want, we wonder how big the universe was after inflation. Well, before inflation, the observable part of the universe, not the whole universe, but the observable part, so everything we see today before inflation was smaller than the size of a proton, smaller than an elementary particle. So imagine this 46 billion light years was smaller than a dot, smaller than a particle, incredibly tiny. Then inflation took that from, and I'm going to use an uh, analogy that's out for this season, took it to the size of a cricket ball. Okay? And then the universe slowed down. So after inflation, the universe stopped expanding so quickly, switched to normal gear. So it's like a car switching from fast gear to normal gear, and then started expanding slowly. And then over 13.8 billion years, that cricket ball size became the size of 46 billion light years across the observable universe. That's pretty incredible to think of everything we see in the sky just the size of a cricket ball. Now, there's a problem with inflation. There's a big philosophical problem because it happens too easily. The theory of inflation says that if you have an energy field anywhere in the early universe, that energy field will trigger super rapid expansion. So inflation is created by an energy field. And if that energy field stays constant for just a trillion of a second, the universe will expand to create this ultra rapid period of expansion. Well, if that happened in our part of the universe, why didn't it happen in other parts of the universe? So you might have other parts of the universe that expanded and created other universes. 
you would call this idea the multiverse. The multiverse is the idea that ours is not the only universe. There could be other universes out there, and we would never be able to contact them. Now, it could be the case that on these other universes, they would develop other Milky Ways and other Earths. Because if you have an infinite number of universes, anything can happen. So, as a colleague of mine, science writer colleague of mine says, we could have Elvises who are still alive on other universes. Okay, so you could have uh, people who are long gone in our universe survive in the other universe just through, through random chance in other universes. Anything that happened here could happen elsewhere, but slightly differently. So, if you have an election here and it goes the wrong way, if you support one party and the other party gets in, if you could somehow put it in the other universe, maybe that would have an Earth that's exactly identical, only your favorite candidate or your favorite sports team would win instead of losing. So that's interesting to think about. But it also means that everything that can happen will happen. Well, some scientists are upset by that because that means that our universe if it's flat, that means that there are other universes that are different. Well, then it means that anything can happen. So we're back to the drawing board, we're back to the starting ground because we don't know why the universe is like it is, if there's an infinite number of universes that are all very different. So some people reject that idea. It's the idea is testable if you could see scars from collisions between our universe and the other. So some people are looking at this baby picture of the universe in the cosmic microwave background and are trying to see scars of collisions with other universes. If those scars are there, then maybe we saw some ancient collision between our universe and the other, and we know that the other universes are out there. So there are a lot of things we can see in the baby picture of the universe through these hotter and colder spots. Now, one thing we see uh, is something which was named the axis of evil, which is an axis of galaxies, uh, points where galaxies are that are lined up in a strange way, almost to create a slash through the universe. We don't really understand if that's just statistical or if that's real. If that's real, then that means the universe is not the same in all directions. We have to explain why the universe is different in some directions than in other directions. So this is a real puzzle, and um, we don't really we don't really know that if it's true or not. Sometimes you see things in the sky and you think they're real, but it's really just something from the human mind. The human mind can play tricks. For example, if you look at the cosmic microwave backgrounds, if you look at that picture, you can see. If, let's see. Okay, if you see right over here, you might see the initials SH. And if you see the initials SH in the sky, that's really clear. Well, that's Stephen Hawking's initials in the sky. So somehow, billions of years ago, the universe, the universe decided to put Stephen Hawking's initials on there. Actually, that's just a statistical clue. Because knowledge just published it in the paper just to show that you can have something that appears a certain way, but it's really an artifact of the human imagination. So probably at least one of you in the audience has those initials, so you can think those are your initials in the sky. So another mystery is this idea of dark flow, which is discovered in 2008, which is clusters of galaxies, groups of galaxies, a bunch of them seem to be moving in the same direction. And they're moving there, but it doesn't seem like there's anything pulling them. So some people said, including this fellow Alexander Fischlinski of NASA, said that maybe this is a tug from another universe pulling on our galaxies. Well, the plant picture is being analyzed to see if this really exists. 
Department of Statistics has given up the loop. So it should be clearer soon, maybe within weeks or months, if this is really true, or if it's just a statistical fluke, something like seeing it all in initials, that was just something that was seen but not as real. So we'll have to see it. But here's a picture of that, the dark flow, and it, it appears as if thousands of galaxies and clusters are moving in a certain direction, which would be truly remarkable if that turns out to be the case. Okay, so because of the problems with inflation, some people don't believe in it anymore. Some people think that the idea of producing so many universes is a problem with inflation. We call these other universes bubble universes because it's like if you have a bath and you put it so you can create all these bubbles. Well, what if our universe is just one of the bubbles in a sea of all these other bubbles? Well, then our universe is no longer unique. And that raises all these philosophical questions. Like, why develop a theory that has so many universes? Why can't I come up with a simpler theory? So because of that, some of the people who propose inflation have come up with a new idea called the cyclic universe, which is that the universe has a higher dimension, and instead of inflation, we have collisions with another universe in a higher dimension, and those collisions create a massive amount of energy, and that massive amount of energy is very smooth, and that seeds the stars and galaxies, and triggers a cycle of creation. Uh, for example, Paul Steinhardt is one of the champions of this theory. He used to be a strong advocate of inflation, and now he's denouncing his own theory. He's against inflation because he thinks it raises too many philosophical issues because of the bubble universes. And now that's supposed to be the idea of cycles. Well, if these cycles happen, that means that sometime in the future of the universe, another universe will collide with ours in a higher dimension, which is hard to picture, and wipe everything out, and restart the cycle, and the universe will start again with the new universe. Well, that is pretty hard to believe, but some cosmologists believe that that's a better idea than having all the other universes. There's another physicist named Roger Penrose who thinks that the universe has a kind of a circular time. The time is like a cycle, and he said that at the end of the universe, everything will clear out, everything will disappear, and it will be just like the beginning of the universe. Or maybe that will become linked up with another universe, and that the universe will cycle forever. But that's the idea of Roger Penrose. So we're analyzing today the Planck satellite data to see if any of these theories could be correct or not. Another mystery of the universe with a colorful name is called the gamma, gamma ray dragons, which are unknown sources of gamma rays in the sky. Gamma rays are extremely energetic photons, and the sky has so many of them. Some of these are produced in the cores of galaxies, but others we don't know really what they're from. This is another cosmic mystery today. Now, I've been talking a lot about telescopes, but maybe some of you think that seeing the universe through a telescope is not enough. Maybe some of you would like to travel into space and explore the universe in a spaceship. Maybe travel around the whole universe and see if it is a donut shape or if it keeps going forever. So, it would be nice if it could travel millions of light years away or even four light years away, which is the distance of the closest star. We discovered in the last few years through the Kepler telescope, we discovered more than a thousand exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet in another solar system. And we realize now that planets are very common in the universe. There are probably trillions of planets out there. And some of these could be just like Earth. Some of these could have life forms, civilizations. So the question is, why haven't we heard from them? And if we haven't heard from them, maybe we could visit them. So it would be very exciting to visit all these planets. And we wouldn't want to visit just any old planet. We would want to visit a planet that's like Earth. We want to visit a planet which is fairly comfortable, that's, a bit of, that's habitable, 
and we call the habitable zone of a star on the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone is not too hot, not too cold, but just right. So in our solar system, there are only a few planets that could be potentially the Goldilocks zone. Earth, and then maybe Mars and Venus. But the other planets are far too hot or far too cold to have ever supported life. We also want to look at rocky planets because rocky planets are the only ones we can land on. If you want to go to land on Jupiter, because you would try to put down your landing gear and land on it, but you would never reach any soil. You would keep going down and down because it's a gas giant. There's no surface to Jupiter. There's no surface to Saturn. So the only planets in the solar system we can land on would be Mercury, which is far too hot. Venus is also very hot. And then we have Earth and Mars. So perhaps someday the humans will hit the score of Mars. There's talk of human exploration of Mars. But that might still be in the far future. But what about going to a habitable exoplanet in another solar system? Well, we know so far of at least a dozen exoplanets that are somewhat similar to Earth and in a habitable zone. So maybe we would want to explore those. Well, that is very idealistic, very optimistic. Can we really develop space travel to travel to these exoplanets? Well, we look at the moon, and we've explored the moon back in the 1960s. And 1960s, it took the astronauts about three days to reach the moon. So, and some of you may know they brought back a rock for this festival, which was one of the main rocks So that was the that was the number one goal of the mission. They knew that this festival would happen someday. We needed a rock. But there were other sides of the goals too. But the fact is, at that speed that they took, that's Speed was is very slow compared to the speed needed to reach stars, unfortunately. If you took the Apollo spacecraft and you were trying to reach the, this, the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, it would take millions of years, right? So maybe some of you plan on a, a special diet and hope to live for millions of years. Maybe some of you are exercising a lot, eating very healthy, hope to live that long. But not everyone can live for millions of years. And even if you have families after families, maybe children and many, many generations, it would take so long to reach the nearest stars. It would take thousands and thousands of generations of people. So we don't really, can't really commit to that. And that's just to reach the nearest star. So in order to reach the nearest stars, we need to vastly speed up space travel. So maybe some of you or engineers can think of a way of vastly speeding up space travel. Well, physicists have some ideas, some theoretical ideas. Engineers will probably have more practical ideas for speeding up space travel. Well, a theoretical idea a physicist has thought of is a traversable wormhole. And maybe some of you saw the movie, recent movie Interstellar which is based on the work of physicist Kip Thorne. Now, Kip Thorne, in the 1980s, proposed the idea of wormholes, and he proposed it to satisfy a science fiction writer's dream. The science fiction writer was actually an astronomer, Carl Sagan, who was working on a novel called Contact, and Carl Sagan asked the question, how can we reach the nearest stars if they're so far away? And he phones his friend Kip Thorne, Kip Thorne said, well, I'm going to do what most professors do if they have a tough question. Let me give it to one of my postgraduate students. So he gave it to one of his PhD students. The PhD student, PhD student took the idea of a black hole and switched it around a little bit and created a wormhole. Now, wormholes are different from black holes because if you go into a black hole, I would not recommend it at all. It wouldn't be very fun because you'd be crushed. You'd be crushed in such a way that you'd be turned into a piece of spaghetti. You'd be stretched in one direction and compressed in another direction. So it's called, actually, the technical name for it is spaghettified. It's turned to spaghetti. 
So uh, you wouldn't want that because even if you could travel to another part of the universe, you wouldn't want to look like spaghetti. It wouldn't be very presentable to meet aliens and look like a piece of spaghetti. Um, I'd say, oh really, do all people from Earth look like that? Um, and plus you'd be irradiated, so you'd be like a microwave spaghetti. Because of all the energy flowing into the black hole. So you wouldn't really survive very long. For most black holes, you would only survive for a fraction of a second going into the black hole. So that's not good for space travel. But there was an idea that Einstein developed back in 1935, which originally was called the einstein rosen Bridge, but became renamed Wormholes. And that's that if you take a black hole, it connects to another part of the universe. But that connection was just mathematical, and Einstein didn't really believe in it. But what if you could take something like that and pop it open and make the passageway much larger? Well, that was the idea behind the personal wormholes, to prop open what's called the throats and make it large enough so that the spaceship can travel through it. And that becomes a traversable wormhole. Well, to make that, you need some kind of material called exotic matter, which is material with a negative mass. And no one has really come up with something like that. Plus, you need mass the size of a galaxy. So if you were trying to think of something like this, maybe you want to do a uh, senior project making your own work uh, you would first need to find your own galaxy and take its mass and condense it into this work wormhole. Well, it wouldn't be very practical. But maybe somewhere some aliens or through a natural phenomena made some wormholes out there that we could find so that's the idea behind wormholes. It's very, very theoretical, but still fun to think about because it would make it possible to travel across the galaxy in a very short amount of time. So here's a little bit of a sketch of a wormhole. So you see in the sketch, you would enter one side travel through it and you come out the other side, and that would be a shortcut in the universe. Okay? So if one side were near Earth and the other side was near Proxima Centauri, you could go to the nearest star, or you could go to an even farther star. Well, there are problems with the idea. One of the problems is that you have something very massive that creates all this gravity and you'd be attracted to it. So Earth would be flung out of orbit if there was a wormhole in our solar system. So if there's a wormhole in our solar system, goodbye solar system because it would destroy the gravity in our solar system. But if the, if the wormhole was not in our solar system, then how could we reach the entrance? It'd be too far away. So once again, engineering students take note. This is a big problem. Maybe if we calculate this tonight when we get home, how you can create a wormhole that's stable and within our solar system, but does not disrupt the solar system. That would be a very interesting project. So if you discover that, you can email me the answer. And the next talk, I can tell the students you know, how to create a real wormhole. Now, the weird thing about wormholes is if you line them up properly, you can create a time machine. If you accelerate from one side of the wormhole compared to the other side, then what happens is the clock of one end slows down compared to the clock of the other end. That's called Einstein's theory of special relativity. If something is traveling close to the speed of light, its clock slows down. Well, if you slow down one side, the time will be different than the other side. So, for example, it could be 2015 on one side and 3015 on the other side thousand year difference. Well, suppose you went into the side where it said 3015, you traveled to the work wall or came out the other side, it'd be 2015 because time is slow on that side. You could travel backward in time and see the past. So that'd be very exciting. So work walls are one of the theoretical ways of traveling backward in time if you can create something like that. It'd be very exciting. Well, if you could do that, then what about changing history? So what about going back in time and 
changing the history of the world or changing your own history. So that would could create a paradox. So one of the well-known paradoxes is called the grandfather paradox. You go back in time and you prevent your grandfather from being your grandmother. Well, then the question is, how would your parents exist and how would you exist? Well, if you didn't exist, then how would you travel backward in time? If you didn't travel backward in time, your grandparents would exist. So it's a paradox because you have two things going on at once. In one universe, you do exist in the other universe, you don't exist. So some theoretical physicist says if backward time travel is possible, it must be self-consistent. So a physicist named Igor Novikov said that perhaps time travel to the past is possible if it's self-consistent, just like if you had a billiards game, and every time you knocked the ball into a hole, you went back in time, and then it came out of another hole and knocked itself into a hole. And you could create a loop where one ball is the cause of its own motion. That creates a cycle. And if this is an eternal cycle, then it's self-consistent, and then there's no paradox. Like, it's just like if you went back in time and did something which was consistent with the present, then that would be perfectly fine. Um, it could be a little strange, though, because what if you went to the Louvre, which is an art museum in Paris, and you went there off hours and you took the Mona Lisa from the wall, and you brought it into your time machine, and you went back in time, and you saw Leonardo da Vinci, and you gave it to him and said, Leonardo, here's a painting. Pretend that you painted this, and you'll be very, very famous someday. And he gets the Mona Lisa, and he claims that it's so meaning, and eventually it goes to Paris and it's put up in the loop, and eventually it's taken it back in time. Well, the question is, who painted it? Nobody painted it. It was just there because it just went back in time again and again and again. So even with self-consistency, you can have a paradox where something is created out of nothing. So that would be very, very strange. There are even science fiction stories like that where somebody is their own parents. There's a story by Robert Heinlein called Oh You Zombies, where a person is their own father and mother at the same time. And the child, they're all the same person because of time travel. So this is very strange. If you have time travel, it creates all sorts of paradoxes. So another way to avoid time travel paradoxes is parallel universes. So if Imagine if you go back in time and to change reality, well, now you're in a new universe. I need to, to finish up. Okay. okay, so then uh, you could have a universe where there's an alternative view, and that would be an alternative reality. You would just be stuck there forever. So parallel universes aside, I think we have enough space in our own universe to explore, even if there aren't any parallel universes. So I hope that someday, with your scientific background, you learn how to explore the universe. Maybe not with spaceships, but through telescopes, and realize the wonders of our universe today. So in conclusion, this is a glorious age for cosmology. There are many mysteries, but it's remarkable that from our tiny enclave, Earth, we can say so much about the universe. So, now, a little plug for my books. Um, these are my two most recent books. This book, Edge of the Universe, is about cosmology, and the other one is the book that's coming out of Asia. It's about the fact that it's about the work of Einstein and Schrodinger. So, that's it for my talk. I hope you learned a little bit about the universe. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I believe there's going to be a question and answer session, is that right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's have question and answers. Anyone? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Good evening, sir. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Very inspiring. Thank you. I actually have three questions. I'm sorry if other other people have a question. I only have three questions. Um, first question is about basic physics. Well, let's consider a typical Newtonian scenario where I'm on a train, uh, traveling at 100 miles per hour, and I have a laser with me. Suppose I switch on the laser. Is the light traveling out of the laser? Does it have a horizontal velocity of 100 miles per hour? Okay. So that's an interesting question. And I think, let's see, let's take one question per person and so we see how many uh, people have questions. So I'm going to answer your question, the first question, and then if we have more time later for questions, I'll answer other people's questions and then we can go back to you if we have more time. So the question is, if you're traveling at a high speed, does the speed of light change? Well, interestingly, uh, someone else thought of that years ago, and that was Einstein. He thought when he was 15 years old, he was in high school, and he thought, well, if you race really fast, you can catch up with a light beam. Well, the strange thing is, light travels at a constant speed. So no matter how fast you're going, light is always going to travel at the same speed. It's always, uh, it always travels at the same rate. So 3.8, uh, 3, times, 3 times 78 meters per second. No matter how fast you're going, and to answer the mystery, why light always seems to travel at the same speed is because if you're traveling faster and faster, your clock is slowing down. And when your clock slows down, you still measure light traveling at the same speed. So the answer to that riddle is that as you travel faster and faster, you think you're getting closer to the speed of light, but really your clock is slowing down, so light moves at the same speed. Well, it's easy. Uh, maybe so. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you just said that uh, this is a field where new developments keep cropping up uh, now and then. Recently, I, mean, I came across a report, like, I think two weeks ago, saying that, uh, talking about the Big Bang similarity, saying that time did not originate from the Big Bang itself. So, how does that change things? I mean, as, as to how you've been thinking till now, uh, how, what do you, how do you think it changes things? I mean, as to how you've been thinking about it so far. Okay, well that is a very interesting question. So when we talk about the Big Bang today, it's a very complex thing because there's an idea that the universe began in a singularity, which is the point with no time and no space. So that would be, the, if that exists, that would be the beginning of time. Then, a trillion of a second later, there was inflation, and inflation was a super rapid explosion, and inflation created all, almost all the matter and energy in the universe. So we can think of that as the Big Bang. So really there are two ideas of the Big Bang. One is the beginning of time, and the other is the beginning of matter and energy. Well, almost everybody believes that matter and energy began at a certain time. That there was some expansion where all the matter and energy in the universe is created. Nobody doubts that. But what people say is before that, whether the universe began at a singularity or if there was some time before that. So that is an open question. So that will not change our theories today because our theories today are based upon what happened after that point, after all the matter and energy is created. We don't really know what happened before the matter and energy of the universe is created. So that's one point. And the other point is that I looked at the paper from which that idea came from. That is just a hypothetical paper. And what happens, uh, I don't want to sound too cynical, but there are hundreds of papers published every year with different theories. People come up with, make calculations, and they come up with theories. But many of these theories uh, turn out to be false, or they're not experimentally provable. But sometimes the media will look at it and say, oh, well, this is interesting. Let's write a new story about it. And once it's a new story, they say, oh, well, this must be re real reality. So I think people will jump the gun a little bit with that paper because it's an interesting idea, but it hasn't been experimentally proven. So we really don't know if the universe began at a singularity where time began, or if there was a universe that lasted forever. We don't know. We'll take two more questions. Good evening, sir. Uh, you earlier mentioned about uh, the size of the universe. Uh, you said uh, the observable, observable universe was around uh, 13.8 billion years. 
uh, light years uh, and uh, the uh, complete uh, universe around 48 billion years uh, light years or something. So how is it measured sir? How do you estimate this? Okay, well, the actual universe, we don't know how big it is actually. Because we don't know what goes beyond what our telescopes can see. So what our telescopes can see is the size of the observable universe. And that's measured, that's measured because we can measure the rate in which galaxies are moving. And we can extrapolate backward in time and we can say, if galaxies are moving at a certain rate now, and we roll the clock backward, when was it the case that the whole universe, observable universe, was at a point? And that's the age of the universe. And by knowing the age of the universe and the speed of the galaxies today, we can see how far we can see out there, how, how far it would take for light to travel. And that tells us the size of the observable universe. So that's how we have to emphasize the observable universe. Well, there could be an infinite universe beyond that. The universe could be infinitely big, we just don't know. Um, good evening, sir. So when you when you were talking about the shape of the universe and its size, uh, well it definitely means that we define something as the edge of the universe. Now space is essentially a void, it's nothing else. So suppose we reach the edge of the universe, how would we be able to tell? Well, once again, it could be the case that the actual universe has no edge. It would be the observable universe. And you wouldn't be able to reach the edge of the observable universe because the universe is expanding faster and faster. So by the time you would get out there, the galaxies are expanding faster and faster. And would be seated beyond the horizon, so you couldn't really reach that. So the answer is there's really no, there's an edge of the observable universe but that edge is artificial. That edge is how far away we can see. Uh, so it'd be like imagine if the ocean, instead of instead of the Earth being circular, if the ocean was infinite in size. But if you look out with a with a, uh, a periscope with the binoculars, you might not be able to see a certain distance to a ship. So that would be the edge of the observable universe, where you can see the farthest you can see out there. So it's really an artificial construct, the observable universe. But it's an important artificial construct because that's all we know about. That's the limit to, limit to our knowledge, is the edge of the observable universe. There's no edge.